service to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As many of you may already know, Wednesday we lost one of our beloved teachers, Mr. Milligan. If you knew Mr. Milligan, you knew that he loved teaching and he loved his students. He had a gift of making chemistry memorable and fun. As a former softball coach, he was tough and passionate. And those who were coached by him knew that behind his tough exterior, he was a teddy bear at heart who wanted the best for his players. Grieving is a complex thing, and our school family is going to grieve the loss of Mr. Milligan in many different ways. If you need support throughout the day, we have counselors available for you. Please let your teacher know if you need to talk with someone. Please join me this morning in a special moment of silence as we remember Mr. Milligan and all of the lives that he positively impacted throughout his years as a husband, father, colleague, friend, teacher, and coach. Thanks, CG, and have a great day. All right, does anybody have any questions over material we covered yesterday? hydrogen bonding to occur, you have to have in one molecule, you have to have the hydrogen bonded to the nitrogen oxygen or four. Okay. The other molecule simply needs to be polar with a nitrogen oxygen or fluorine as part of that formula. Okay. Um, let me find an example here. So I've got some I've got some notes that I've used in the past that I haven't had a chance to go and refine that illustrates this.
All right, for those of you at home, you should see a desert scene. That is correct. Okay. Uh, I'm going to assume you guys can't. Mac, can you see that? That's better. I, they, they'll help me uh, explain it better. Okay, so <clears throat> hydrogen bonding, although it, it's it's special in a sense that the the attraction's extra strong. Okay, and that's due to the fact that the hydrogen is going to be extra positive because it's just a bare proton. Okay, the <clears throat> Um, a couple of things that we observe every day is water. You know, the, as we saw yesterday, the mass of a compound contributes to its boiling point. Okay. It, it's a measure of, you know, how strong the intermolecular forces are due to the London dispersion forces. And if you have a polar molecule, you know, most of the time, if the molecule is small, like water, it's the polarity that's driving everything. Water has very little London dispersion forces going on. Okay. All, <coughs> all of the other compounds that are in group six on the periodic table, so H2S, H2SE, H2TE, they all have the exact same structure as water as you would expect, they're all in the same column, but they're all gases, okay? Gases at temperatures well below where water would freeze. So the hydrogen bond is important for us in that respect, and we see that happening every day, okay? But hydrogen bonding is really important in nature because hydrogen bonding is what is involved in our DNA. It's involved in protein folding. You know, all most of our biological processes in some way, shape, or form are going to be affected by the hydrogen bond. Now, you learned in biology class that adenine goes with thymine, A, T, C, G. Thymine can't go with guanine. Okay? Adenine can't go with cytosine. And the reason why is because of the hydrogen bonding that occurs between them. In our thymine, we can see here that it doesn't matter what this is, okay? What we've got is we've got a hydrogen bonded directly to a nitrogen. So there's our covalent bond. We meet that criteria. On the other molecule here, this nitrogen, which this hydrogen is attracted to, that's not bonded to any hydrogen. It's bonded to other carbons, okay? But that attraction, because the nitrogen has that high electronegativity, it's going to be extra negative comparatively. So this is going to be a, a relatively strong attraction here. Same thing's happening on this part of the molecule, except on the opposite side. We've got the nitrogen or the hydrogen bonded covalently to the nitrogen, but then attracted to this oxygen that's just bonded to a carbon. So that'd be a carbon there, okay? The hydrogen bonds, well, okay, and we go down here to cytosine, we can say this, we see the same, uh, same scenarios taking place. The reason why cytosine and guanine go together is because they have three areas where you can form that hydrogen bond. Whereas thymine and adenine, you only have the two areas where you can form that hydrogen bond. It's not to say that they can't go together, 
They shouldn't. You guys talk about errors in biology, like coding errors. You get a misplaced, uh, I can't remember what it's called. You get a misplaced, like you, you, you replace a thymine here with a cytosine. Okay, that's not good because things don't match up well. Right? That's why they're, they don't go together. The importance of the hydrogen bond here is that the hydrogen bond is strong enough. All of these are strong enough together to keep those two halves of the DNA molecule together. The DNA molecule is relatively stable. That's why we can go, you know, we can dig up, uh, you know, mastodons. that are tens of thousands of years old pull out the DNA and have a pretty good sample of DNA that we can look at. <clears throat> so they're, they're stable, but they're weak enough for us to be able to break them to replicate. So these bonds here, these not, I shouldn't say bonds, these attractions due to the hydrogen bonds are strong enough to keep the DNA together but weak enough to allow them to come apart during the replication process. So you can duplicate them. And then they come back together. You've seen all the animations and stuff with the RNA going through, unzipping it, and it comes back together. Okay. And they're going to come back together correctly because these things line up. But this is... I probably should have pulled this out yesterday, but this is a good example of, you know, our criteria. We have to have the hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, and then that hydrogen is going to be attracted to another nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. But it doesn't have that other one doesn't have to be bonded to a hydrogen. Okay. Questions? Yeah. On these? Yeah, like the ones in the middle. This part of the compound. Uh, like, oh, okay. So take this hydrogen, this hydrogen is part of the cytosine. Okay. So the solid lines here are like our Lewis structures. So this hydrogen is sharing its electrons with that nitrogen. The dotted lines here are representing that attraction that we don't have that. It's not a covalent bond. And that, that's the thing I don't like about the, the name hydrogen bond. It has the term bond in it, but it's not a bond. It's just a, it's just a really strong intermolecular force. Uh, I think in the document that we looked at yesterday, they gave the energy values. I can't remember what they are, but like, the, the, the energy required to break a break a hydrogen bond in water, I think it was like 40 some. Whereas a chemical bond would be like 400. You know, so the, the, the energy that we have involved in that attraction is really small compared to an actual chemical bond. But it's really strong compared to other intermolecular forces, which would require much less energy to, to break apart. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. So um, on the on the liquid um, problem in the intermolecular forces worksheet, um, would you identify like if it's an alcohol or the actual um, formula. Let me pull up the. So where okay, so what where are you at on that worksheet? Um, the unknown liquid problem one at the bottom, near the bottom. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so.
So for those of you at home, Violet's talking about the, the worksheet we worked through yesterday and discussed. Uh, it's on the, uh, not the last page, but second last page, question one under problems. It says you are given an unknown liquid to identify. You are told that the molecule formula or the molecular formula of the compound is C6H6O2. You measure the boiling point of the compound and find it to be 198 degrees Celsius. Identify this unknown liquid and explain your reasoning. You may wish to consider following boiling points of various molecules in your analysis. Um, It looks like there's, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how they're doing that because the, well, I don't know if there's another worksheet or another page or two that relates to this or not. Because, go ahead. It says something about above a number set, like another thing from chemistry structure and diagram. Uh, okay, so I'm not overly concerned about the exercises of the problems. So there's more information. You, you, there's more stuff there that you need. Now, <clears throat> boiling point of that high, C2H6, C2H6O2. That's, that's acetic acid, I think. got to be some variation of that. Now, like I said, some variation of that, because we could put this over here and switch things around. That has a fairly high boiling point, right? 198 Celsius. Keep in mind, water is boiling point of 100. So I mean, we use water as a comparison a lot. Why would this have such a high boiling point? Well, one, it's it's bigger than water. Okay. But two, it's got those. Can this have hydrogen bonding between molecules? Do we have hydrogen bonded to oxygen? So yeah, we can have hydrogen bonding occur. And that is going to make that, because there's two sites that that can happen on, that's gonna be fairly strong, okay? So there's more, there's more information that you would need with the textbook that they're, I think these, these documents that I use periodically, they're, they're associated with a specific textbook but you don't have to do all the stuff with the textbooks. This, the material that we covered in class yesterday, that, that's the 
most the most important part to get the concepts out. Okay. okay. Other questions? Okay. What's that? We, I know. We I can't need, steer. We, I know. I know. I need to put the uh, screen of the board back up. So that's the that's the formula that was being referenced there, the compound. And we've got the OHs, got two OHs there that we can um, have the hydrogen bonding. That's going to that's what's making that extra strong attraction and have such a high boiling point. Other questions? Okay. So um, pull up the, the uh, document that I have linked to in the module. Uh, it's the one dealing with kinetic energy. So if you go to drive, you can go straight there and get it. Um, Claire and what's your name? Matt. Matt? Um, you should have everything. You should have drive shared with you now okay so the document's titled oh, where am I at? There we go. kinetic energy temperature and states now for those of you at home I'm going to have this, I'm going to have stuff up on the side screen. Um, I'm not going to be writing it, writing on it, and filling it out. Okay, but you guys need to be able to. Or these kind of like guided notes to follow along in class. Okay. So in the last unit, we looked at the molecular structure, chemical bonding, how are atoms or how are, how are the molecules held together? In the beginning of this unit that we're in, okay, I'm so back up. We also looked at whether a molecule was polar or not. And hopefully after yesterday and in, 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 in discussing in class and looking at the worksheet, you guys understand better why identifying a compound as being polar or nonpolar is important. Because the, identifying whether a compound is polar or nonpolar really does determine what kind of attractions it's going to have between other molecules. So those attractions between other molecules, they involve energy. All attractions involve energy changes of one sort or another. So right now outside, I think on the news this morning said we're working on day 10 with temperatures below the freezing point of water. They say 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We use zero degrees Celsius because we're scientists. So the temperature outside hasn't gotten above zero degrees Celsius in 10 days. That means our snow and stuff's not melting. It can't. Okay. Well, that's related to temperature. It's related to energy because all of these, all of these attractions, forming attractions, breaking attractions, these are all going to involve energy of one sort or another. 
as we saw and discussed yesterday, we, we saw that increasing temperature for a boiling point relates to stronger attractions between the molecules. It takes more energy to break something apart that has a lot of attraction. Now, those things can be measured. Okay, we can measure the amount of energy that's required for these, these processes to occur. So today we're going to focus on looking at and defining, you know, some of our energy values and also looking very closely at the states of matter and what their properties are. Because you guys are coming into this class and I know after doing this for 30 some years, there's a lot of misconceptions about what solids, liquids and gases are and how energy relates to those. Okay. So let's start off with what is kinetic energy and what is the mathematical formula for kinetic energy? So you guys can answer the first part of that question fairly easily. What is kinetic energy? Somebody quickly, we don't have all day. John. Say, say again. Okay, something the energy that something has when it's moving. So kinetic energy is related to the motion of the material, okay? So um, the formula for that, ready? The formula for that is kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. Who's had physics or is in physics? You got this then, right? Okay. So this, this is not going to be anything new for you. So kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. Matt, in the very back, if things aren't, if I'm not writing big enough, you let me know, okay? So what this is telling us is that our kinetic energy has two components. And as John said, it's the energy something has when it's moving. Well, if it's moving, it's got a velocity. That's the V. That value is squared. The other part of that is our mass. What mass does that object have? Okay. Now, to help illustrate a couple of things here, I want you to do the next parts, A, B, and C, and then I want you to do the comparisons. So I'm gonna give you about you know, five minutes here, do those calculations. It'll probably be less than 10, five minutes, but do those calculations. And we will talk about them. Oh. As part of doing that calculations, include the units on your kinetic energy. Getting the number is easy. Getting the unit might be a little bit of a challenge. Let's see how you do, okay?
Some things. Worry about the units last. All right. What's kinetic energy for A? Hollered out. B plus one two five. Three point one two five. Yeah. That's not the correct significant digits. I'm not going to worry about it right now. Okay. What's kinetic energy for B? What's kinetic energy for C? Okay. So from here to here, what happened to the kinetic energy? What changed between A and B? Zane? The velocity double. The velocity double. But what happened to the kinetic energy? Velocity doubled, but what happened to the kinetic energy? It's on the board, people. 
quadrupled, went up by four times. Why? Squared. It's squared. Okay. All right. Kinetic energy between one, uh, A and C. What happened? Matt? So both of them doubled. Fair answer to B. Was the value changed? Answered that. A to C, how is the value changed? Which variable has the greatest effect on the kinetic energy? We both changed them the same amount. We both doubled, we doubled both of them. Which one has the greater effect? Matt? Why? Because it's squared. <coughs> So if you want to get co more kinetic energy, make it go faster. Don't make it heavier, make it go faster, okay? Now, let's look at the units. I'm just going to break it down a little bit here. So, oops, two five. Okay, if I squared five meters per second, what am I going to get as a quantity just for that part? We do the easy part. What's five squared? Point five. Now, hard part. What's your units? Meters per second squared. Uh -huh. Close. You said meters per second squared? That's acceleration. Matt? Would you say meters squared over? Uh, there right now. So when we get our final answer for that, it's going to be 3.125 because you're taking 25, you're taking a quarter of it, right? 3.25. Half. Something's not right. What did I do wrong? 3.125? Oh, and then divide by half. I forgot that. Now, if I take kilograms times that, what do I get? So may home pop in too if you got if you know it. What am I missing there? Top or bottom? This is the unit of energy. Okay. It's Raxton. We don't use that unit, do we? It's cumbersome. It's important, okay? What is it, Braxton? Okay. Now, here's the thing. Our units, I didn't use grams because we, in the kinetic energy, this unit for mass should be in kilograms. That's the standard. Okay. Velocity measured meters per second. And okay, meters and seconds, those are standard. But the reason why we're using kilograms is because that's the standard. 
I know in class, we normally use just grams because grams is what we measure stuff in, in chemistry in the lab. We generally aren't going to deal with kilogram amounts of materials, right? So, <clears throat> questions on this. So the unit, so when you're doing your calculations for kinetic energy, if you're asked for the unit, I will accept either, but just put J. That's the easy way around it. Okay. J for joules. Questions. Pretty straightforward, right? So the next part of this is asking. How are temperature and kinetic energy related? So I'm going to give you a definition. Are you ready? Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. I want to make this as clear as I possibly can, because coming into this class, I know that you guys probably have the misconception that temperature is energy. And no, temperature is not energy, okay? Temperature is simply a measure of the kinetic energy. It's an average. And why an average? Well, um, This thermometer is reading 21.6, 21.5, 21.4, So it must have been a little warmer in that drawer than normal. It keeps going down. <coughs> All right, 21.1 degrees Celsius. So for those of you who are to give you an idea, and switch it to Fahrenheit with the button. There we go. At 69.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not cold. Outside it's cold, right? That's another misconception. There is no such thing as hot or cold. We'll talk about that later. There we go. So what that temperature is telling us, 21 degrees Celsius, that's telling us that the average energy in the room is going to correspond to a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius. There are a bunch of equations that we are not even going to look at or touch that lead us from what the actual, what the kinetic energy is to the temperature. The reason why we need it as an average is because what is that thermometer measuring the temperature of? Let me set it. What kind of? More specifically, Chloe? The air. The air, the air right there. Okay. Is the temperature of the air in this room the same everywhere? No. If I were to measure the temperature right above my hand here, my, the temperature is going to go up because the air above my hand is warmer because my hand is warming up the air. Now, 
without you guys in here, without people in here, if I were to give it a day, most everything, as long as the thermostat kept it at a relatively constant temperature, everything in this room would eventually reach the same temperature. Okay. If something is warmer than something else, energy is going to be transferred between those things. Not temperature, but what, what's called heat. Again, something that we're, we're going to just talk about on the surface. But my T here, uh, it's probably at about maybe 35, 40 Celsius. It's cooling down though, because it's losing energy to the air around it, because the air around it is a lower temperature. When you came in this morning, since you're the first ones to come into this classroom, when you sat down on your chair, chair felt cold. Cold and hot are feelings. Okay, they are not measurable. What is hot or cold to one person is not hot or cold to another person. I find it comfortable in here. I know some of you find it extraordinarily cold, but I'll tell you what, it's been the same temperature all year long. It's just how you feel that day, okay? So <clears throat> we wanna make sure that we're making that very fine distinction that temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy, the average. Now, why average? How many air molecules do we have? A lot, gazillions, okay? Are all of those air molecules moving at the same velocity? No. Some are moving really fast, some are moving really slow. So for us to get to, we cannot, we don't have computers fast enough to be able to keep track of all of the velocity changes that are going to occur in our gas molecules. I'm not going to open it up because it's not been opened up, but the temperature of this, I'm going to, I'm going to approximate probably about 21 degrees Celsius. Why? Because it's been sitting out since Wednesday. And the temperature of this room stays relatively constant. So if I were to stick a thermometer down in there, I'm going to be pretty confident that it's going to be about 21, maybe a little bit below, maybe a little bit above, but really close to that. But I can say with confidence that not every one of those water molecules is moving the same velocity. That's why we have to have an average. So while temperature is not energy, temperature is a measure of energy. If I wanted to know what the kinetic energy was in this room, we would need to measure every molecule in this room and add them all together. Okay. Who's got questions? All right. So I'm going to draw on the board to represent what the next question there is asking about. So this is system A. This is system B. They're both made of the same material. They both have the same mass. <clears throat> They're both at the same temperature. What does that tell us? Matt? 
Not about. Okay. okay. Add one word in there. They have the same average kinetic energy. Okay. So the kinetic energy average for A is going to equal the kinetic energy average for B. What can we say about the velocities? The molecules that make up A and the molecules that make up B, what can we say about their velocity? Add, add one or two words. No, they're the same. Same average. Is that, did you, somebody else said that over here. You mumbled it? You're right. On average, they have the same average velocity. That's going to that kinetic energy part. This right here is what's different of those molecules. Okay, so if they're the same substance, they got the same chemical compound, whatever that has, you know, the chemical formula. The masses of the individual molecules, they're going to be the same. It's their average, they're, they're how fast they're moving, that's what's different. And these are connected then, right? So if the velocity is different, and our temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy, then it has to be the same average velocity. That's the, that's the connection there. Because the, mass, the masses are staying the same. Question. Okay, if two systems made of different materials are at the same temperature, okay, Oops. which one's greater in mass to say? System A is greater in mass. So the mass of A is greater than the mass of B. They are at the same temperature. What can we say about the kinetic energy? They are at the same average. Why are they same average kinetic energy? at the same temperature. Who's answering all these questions? Is that Matt in the back? I'm glad I, Matt, I'm glad you came into my class. I have somebody who will answer my questions and is actually sounding smart. Thank you. Look at all you other slugs out there. I may question your smartness, but I'm not going to question how quiet you guys are. Thank you, Matt. You keep it up, carrying this class. All right. What about the velocity? So our, our masses are different. The temperatures are the same. Our average kinetic energies are the same. What about the velocity? I shouldn't have erased that all. I should have erased my equal sign. What's that? 
Nope, can't be. Because well, if you had, if their if their average kinetic energies are the same, so this is the same, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm going to call, let's just call it 10. Okay, uh, 10. <coughs> I'm trying to make my math easy. Uh, Right? Yeah, right. Well, let's plug in here and say, all right, my kinetic energy for B, because they're the same temperature, right, is equal to 20, because they're the same. One half, all right. Let's make it five. Okay. So the mass of B is five. Because we said up here, the mass of B is less than A. I didn't say how much, I just said less. Solve for V. Chloe? Not that I don't trust you, but can I get confirmation on that? Yeah, sure. Okay. I always confirm. Does that make sense? A is what? A, A has less mass, correct? For it to have the same kinetic energy, what's it have to do? Have a higher velocity. What position you play? The one. Can you catch? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. All right. Move the iPad. I don't want to break it. <laughs> you ready? Yes. Uh, I'm going to throw them about the same velocity. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Which one was harder to stop? That one. Same size? Yeah. That's the same mass though, right? Nope. That's a bunch of lead. That makes sense. Okay. So the mass of that's about 18 times the water. Because they got about the same volume. Mm -hmm. Right? So they had the same velocity, but did they have the same kinetic energy? No. no. All right. So when we're talking about temperature, we're talking about temperature. We've got to be very careful about how what its definition is. Again. You came into this class with some misconceptions about it. Everything in this room, if you weren't in here, everything in this room would essentially have the same temperature. Would everything have the same velocity? No, on average, I should say average velocity. No, the stuff that has more mass is going to be traveling slower because it doesn't have to move as fast to have the same kinetic energy. Or vice versa, the stuff that's light that doesn't have as much mass those things are going to have to travel faster on average to have the same kinetic energy. I got two Johns in here. Very widely differing in mass. Okay. 
Little John's going to have to run a lot faster to have the same effect as Big John would. Okay? I got two masks, but they look like they're about the same. Okay? <clears throat> Questions? Okay. Oh, shoot. I, I'm going to change this for my other classes. I meant for the solids to come before the liquids. So I'm going to talk about the solids first. I know I don't have a lot of room on here to write, but uh, yeah, you guys studied solids, liquids, and gases in middle school at one point in time. Okay. You guys have a pretty good idea of what solids and liquids and their properties are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, but <laughs> there's some things you may not necessarily have correct. So, solids, shape and volume, how we would describe them. Matt? Um, <coughs> you know what? I don't have that on here, so we should probably add that. What? What? The proximity to each other. You're right. In a solid, the proximity is generally closer. I say generally, all right, because it's not a definite. To be honest with you, solids and liquids, the distance between the molecules is not a huge difference. There is, but it's not huge. Okay. But if I were to say, I, I've got, you know, this calculator, it's a solid. What can we say about its shape? It doesn't change. Doesn't change. It's got a definite shape. What about the volume? If I wanted to ruin it, I could dump it down into water. And the water, we could use the, the water to measure the volume change. What's the volume of this? Is it changing? So it's constant. So solids, they're going to have a definite shape. They're going to have a definite volume. Those things aren't going to change. Unless you do something to them, right? I'm going to skip this one come, and we'll come back to it. Describe the density of a solid. So density, remember, is, the, is the, it, the, it's defined by the mass divided by the volume. In general, in general, solids are what? They're more dense. This kind of goes to what Matt said, because you know, the molecules themselves are closer together. Not always the case. What's more dense, solid water or liquid water? Liquid water. That's why ice floats. Okay. So we're talking about some generalities here. Describe the compressibility. Does anybody know what that is? Chloe? Uh, right idea, wrong turn. So you, your 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 uh, motions were explaining it perfectly. Is you're compre you're pushing them together. I mean, how much closer can we get, so get solids? And the answer to that is you really can't. So the comp compressibility for a solid is essentially zero. I'm not saying it's zero, okay? You put things in a hard enough press, it'll it'll squish. You guys seen that? What is it? The Russian dude who smashes things in the in the press. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? <clears throat> 
if you get a strong enough press, you can you can squish things, right? For solids, though, we're going to essentially say that it's essentially zero, not zero, but essentially zero. I'm going to skip this one for right now. We don't need it for today. We'll come back to it. Let's go back up to the describe the molecular motion of a solid. So this is a solid. How are the molecules moving? OK, so the first words I heard was slowly. That's completely false. Okay. What determines how fast the molecules are moving? Kinetic the kinetic energy and well, that's the velocity is the measure of it, but kinetic energy and. Look at the equation. Mass. The mass. Temperature, which is the measure of the average kinetic energy and mass. Solid particles, we cannot describe them as moving slowly. I'll give you an example of that here in a couple minutes. Let's go to other things. I think what you guys are doing, and if you had, I'm sorry, <coughs> your middle school teachers may have lied to you. I think we've established that fact throughout the year. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so what is it that you're saying is slow, but would be a better descriptor that's not related to velocity. What's their motion like? Same? Like secluded. They can't move very much if they're in a specific space. Okay. Your explanation is spot on. They I, so <clears throat> I use different terms, but your explanation is spot on. They are they're isolated, they're stuck in a specific location. We would describe their, their motion as more vibratory. They're vibrating around a fixed point. Their motion is limited to that small little space. So you can kind of think of it, don't, don't it's not, but you can kind of think of it is you've got a box for each particle and the particle has to stay in that box. So I think what you guys have been told about the motion of molecules using the term slow is better described as limited. So velocity is how far something can move in a certain amount of time. Well, if it can't move very far, that's fine. It just can't move far. It doesn't necessarily mean it's slow or fast. It just can't move very far, all right? Okay, let's go to liquids. So describe the shape and volume of a liquid. So I got a liquid in this in this bottle. What can we say about the volume of that liquid? Okay, conforms to the can. That's that's more related to the shape. You're right. It conforms to the the uh, the, the, the shape of the container. Because if I poured it into a square cup, it it would take the square. What would its volume be, though? Same. 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 So volume is the same. Shape changes. 
So that implies there's a little bit of difference here now then between the solid and the liquid, where the solid, the molecules are stuck. That's what makes it a definite shape. They're stuck that way. Are the molecules in here stuck? Well, John, okay, John, you shook your head yes. Well, I didn't hear like testing whether water molecules are staying stuck in between. Okay, so they're attracted, if that's what you mean by stuck. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're attracted to the other mo water molecules, but not so much so that they can't move around. So the molecules in here can move around. You'd be surprised at how much they can move around. But you'd also be surprised at how much they don't. If I were to keep, if I were to just let this sit here like that, and I was to keep track of, you know, water molecule number three forty-eight up at the top, okay, and I were to keep track of it, it's probably not going to move very far in terms of us. It can move far in terms of other molecules, but it's not going to be like making a trip down to the bottom of this, you know, container and back up. That might take years, to be honest with you. But the motion of that molecule compared to that in a solid, very much more free. It's not stuck in place. Again, why this thing can, you know, they can move around. We're going to skip the motion for a second. Describe the density of a liquid. Say? It's less dense than a solid, but more dense than gas. Okay. I'm going to add to that. I'm going to say it's a little bit more dense. Let, I'm sorry, a little bit less dense than a solid. Just to give us some some perspective here, okay? But very much more dense than what a gas is going to be. Correct compressibility. We said solids, essentially, you can't compress them. Liquids, can you compress them? Matt? <laughs> we got competing mats. I'm going to say no. Let's put it this way, though. Are they more compressible than solids? Yes, they're still not very compressible. Do you guys know what a hy what hydraulics are? Yeah. Okay, so uh, heavy machinery. Okay, in heavy machinery, they use really thick oils. They're they're liquids. But in the hydraulics, so what you do is you. you and when you take physics, I don't know if you talk about this or not, but you take a big piston with a, a large, you know, round vol or a volume of liquid, and you push on that, and you have it to a little tube. Okay, that's going to that's going to multiply the force. But here's the thing: hydraulics, hydro means liquid. Okay. You're using that liquid, and they're pushing on it to move other stuff because that hydraulic fluid is not going to compress. It's going to try to keep its volume. Okay. Like, you know, the, the, if I take a liquid and if I was to fill this up with water and push it really hard, it's going to come out really, really fast. But if I were to cap it up and try and push that liquid in, not going to happen. Not saying it can't, saying I'm not going to be able to. And even if you have really, really powerful machines, you're still not going to be able to change that volume significantly. 
what uh, the, the, the we'll skip the evaporation vaporization for uh, next time. So let's go back up to the motion of the molecules. How would you describe the motion of the molecules in a liquid? Claire? They're more free to move than solids, but not as much as gases. They're more free to move than solids. But not, they're not even close to being the same as what gases are. Is there a limitation on the movement of the molecules? Where? What's the limitation? Inside the container. Inside the container. Or within the liquid itself. So the molecules in the liquid, they're free to move around within the liquid. So I think the biggest misconception that people have starts off with that solids part. Oh, you know what? I'm glad that nobody said. Because what, what, what coming into the class, what would you have said about the motion of the liquid molecules that you didn't now? Chloe? They're faster, They're faster than solids. No, they're not faster than solids. They just have more freedom of movement. Okay. All right, this makes gases easy. So describe the shape and volume of a gas. Wow. Whatever. <laughs> it's, it's, <clears throat> could I take all of the air in this room and put it into, you know, like, Half the room. Yeah. Can I put it in a quarter of the room? Yeah. I, eventually, I'm going to get to the point where I would make the air in the here a liquid. Okay. But we can, it, it doesn't have a definite volume. It's got the volume of whatever it's in. Shape? No definite shape. Can we say that the gas fills the room? I don't know if I have this turned on or not. If I do. If I sealed this room up and I took every bit of air out, one, that'd be nearly impossible. I could get the price, I could, I could get most of that. So if I got all of the air out of this room and I turned this gas jet on, everybody listen. You hear your hiss? Would the amount of gas that I let out fill this room? What? What's that? Exactly. If I put, so let's get extreme and ridiculous. If I put, took every particle of gas out of this room and I put two particles of gas in the room, would they fill the room? Technically, yeah. They're going to equally distribute throughout the room. Okay. So for gases, they're going to fill whatever container they're in. That's why they don't have a definite shape or volume. They're just going to expand to fill whatever they're in, whatever they're constrained. Density of a gas. Is 
Lane? Uh, a lot less than the first solid gain test. Or not solid gain test, solid gain test. A lot less than solids and liquids. Keep in mind, if I poured this water out onto the floor, would it evaporate? Would it be dry by the end of the day? Probably, it depends on how puddled up it was. Eventually though, it would all evaporate, right? Well, the density of water as a liquid here is one gram per milliliter. If I let this water evaporate in this room, it's whatever, however much mass I have in the volume of the room, which is really big compared to the volume of this, okay? Compressibility of a gas, compressible or not? Yeah. yeah, I mean, some of you may have one at home, an air compressor. What's that? Or the air cans too, compressed air. If I take my syringe, now I can use it. It's full of air, right? I cap it up. Am I gonna be able to push this in? Well, yeah, I am. Okay, I can compress, and what I'm doing is I'm forcing those molecules closer together. I can't do that with a solid and a liquid. I'm not saying it can't be done with a solid and a liquid. I can't. Okay, if I put water in here, if I try, I can push all the way along. I can push as hard as I want. I can jump up and down on it. I'm not gonna. It's not gonna compress. There's not enough force, not enough energy for us to do that. Okay. So that gets us to the last part here. Let's put what we just discussed to the test. So solid, liquid, and gas all have the same temperature. The molar mass of the gas is 44. The molar mass of the liquid is 56. And the molar mass of the solid is 18. What statements can you make about the following when comparing the three compounds? I, I'm going to say, I'm going to change that and just say, so compare, rank them, use the alligator, you know, your, your um, what do you guys call them? Your greater than less than values. What's that? Well, what, what's, what's the arrows? I call them alligators. What are, they, what are they called? Steros? Is that what they're called? Inequalities? Oh. See, I always just thought that was inequality. Well, I don't teach math. Okay. I mean, I know how to use the symbols, I just don't know what they're called. <laughs> so use the inequality symbols. For each one of those things, tell me about those values. How do they relate to each other? Give you a couple of minutes here.
Who's got velocity? Zane. <clears throat> no. Matt. Solid, liquid, and gas. I agree. What's the matter, Zane? I don't know. Okay. No. Well, I mean, you can use the formula to reason it out, though. They all have the same temperature, which means they all have the same kinetic energy. But their masses are different. So we look at this as kind of a relationship like for this number here to remain the same. If we raise this, so if mass goes up, what has to happen to the velocity? So the one with the largest mass will have the slowest velocity. Okay. Temperature. John? Motion. Thanks. Gas movement. And our motion, I guess we can say it's like based on the freedom of the movement. Clear? To be a solid, you at the same temperature, okay? That's one of the keys. At the same temperature, to be a solid, you have to have stronger forces of attraction. For the life of me, I can't remember what the compound was that has a mass of 56. I'll figure it out eventually, but the 18 grams per mole, That's water. And I said the molar mass of a solid is 18 grams per mole. What does it imply about the temperature? I know we already said the temperatures are the same, but what does this tell us? If I'm using 18 grams per mole and that's water, what's the temperature have to be, Zane? Or below zero or below. Okay. So 44 grams per mole was carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, if it's below zero degrees Celsius outside, you don't have it when you breathe out. You don't have like chunks of carbon dioxide coming out of your mouth or nose, okay? 
You don't have liquid pouring out of your mouth and nose. Like I said, I can't remember what the, what the 56 is, but that was our liquid, okay? Our mystery liquid. I can't remember what it is. But to give you an example, isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, that has a mass of 60. And if you put it in the refrigerator, it's not going to freeze. Put it in the freezer, it's not going to freeze. You might be able to, it depends on how low you get your temp your thermometer or your temperature in your fridge. But at zero degrees Celsius or a little bit below that, it's not going to be a solid, it will be a liquid. So our velocity, because this has the greatest, I'm sorry, this has the least mass. Remember. Our velocity is related to our temperature and kinetic energy you know, or, or mass. Because it has the lowest mass, it has to have the greatest velocity. But the thing is, is that velocity is occurring over a really, really short distance. It's just vibrating back and forth. It's just doing that really fast. That's what that's probably the biggest misconception that people come in with. Because you were told in middle school, solids move slower than liquids, which move slower than gases. No, 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 no. Their freedom of movement is different. How they move around is different. Okay. Question. I have anything for you to do. Just enjoy your three day weekend. Okay. And then I will see you again on Thursday and Friday. Questions? You guys at home have any questions? All right, I'm ending it. Bye, have a good week.